All right, my friends, we are going to look at an example of using the dreaded Biot Savart law to find the magnetic field um, at a point, well, a distance x um, away from the center of a current carrying loop. And actually, that's along the axis of symmetry. Uh, and so we're just going to find the magnetic field at this point that's kind of hovering to the right of this um, loop. And so what we should do first is actually write down the Biot Savart law. So here's the Biot Savart law. Um, what it does is it relates the, um, uh, it finds a little chunk of magnetic field dB that is caused by a little chunk of current carrying wire IDL. So here's the little IDL, or here's one of them anyway. And we could find the magnetic field that's caused by just that little piece. And then later we'll find the total by adding them up, the pieces up. Well, so what I recommend doing when using the Biot Savart law is it's certainly helpful to draw um, the little um, elements DL, the little length elements. So here is one here. It's kind of at the top of the loop of wire, um, carrying the current kind of somewhat out toward you a bit. So here's this little element DL. Corresponding to that DL would be a little radial vector called R that points from the DL to the point that you care about. So here's the R vector that goes with that DL. So DL and R are actually perpendicular here. Um, and then the DB that corresponds with that IDL, that particular IDL, would point this way. So it's actually perpendicular to the R vector um, and actually pointing along the direction of DL cross R. And so that DB goes with that DL that's at the top of the loop. We could pick another DL. That there, here would be another DL at the bottom of that loop. It's kind of carrying the current somewhat into the page here, uh, into the screen. And the R vector that goes with that one would point from, again, from the little bit of current up to the point that we care about. And the DB that's associated with that uh, IDL would point this way, would point somewhat down and to the right. Uh, and we can do this with other bits of the of the loop. So there's a part of the loop that's sort of closest to you right here. And that bit of current would make a field that comes somewhat out of the page, a little bit toward you. Um, in fact, it would be on the edge of uh, kind of a little cone whose base would be defined by uh, this circle that goes through the tips of the other DB arrows there. Um, and in fact, you could pick a part of the current carrying loop that's toward the back of the loop here. And that, again, kind of playing by right hand rule, would generate a magnetic field that points this way. So by the time you sweep around all the little bits of current IDL, the little dBs that they cause would sweep out a cone here. OK, and so the deal is the the is that if we want to find the grand total magnetic field B, we're going to have to add up all these dBs. But all the dBs point in different directions. They sweep out a cone. Well, so what you can tell from that is sort of the the Y direction um, bits of dB would actually cancel out. And we really only need the um, components of all these vectors that point to the right. So we really just need this guy, the dB X's. And so if we can just peel off all the dBx's, we'll be able to add all of them up. Well, so one way to peel off a component that goes horizontally here is to define an angle that I'm going to call theta. And what that is, it's basically the angle um, from sort of the edge of the cone to its axis of symmetry. So here's this angle theta. Well, then if we want to peel off the x components of all the dBs, all we have to do is write dB cos theta. So we just need to slap an extra cosine of theta on this expression we have for dB. Um, so I'll do that now. So the x components of dB would just be this expression for dB times this extra cosine theta that I threw in there. OK, so in this second line, I've kind of done two steps. One is I've thrown a cosine theta in there to peel off all the x components. And the other thing I did is since dL and R are perpendicular, their cross product, the cross product dL cross R, just has magnitude dLR. Um, so I've gotten rid of the cross product by just writing that this is dLR. And then from all these dBs, I've peeled off the x component by slapping this extra cosine theta in there. 
So now we have an expression for just the X components of the magnetic field that's generated here at the point of interest, but that's all we want is the X component. Uh, and so our, our next little move, we're actually ready to sort of integrate these or add them all up. What I like to do is before integrating anything is things that are constant, I kind of notice them and push them over to the left. And everything here is a constant actually, except for DL. So this little R is a constant. So notice the bits of current are always the same distance away from the point of interest. So this little R is actually a constant. Um, eventually we'll rewrite it in terms of givens in the problem, capital R and X. But for now, I'm just gonna treat it as a constant. And then a little bit of a gift in this problem is that cosine theta is actually also a constant because the angle of this cone doesn't change. So all this stuff is constant except for the little um, the little DL is going to be the, the thing that we're going to integrate over or add up. Well, so uh, this bottom expression here is an expression for um, the X component of a, of a little bit of magnetic field DB. And so we just need to add them all up. So to add them all up, you need to integrate both sides. Integrating or adding up all the dBxs will just give you the total Bx. And you see there's all these constants that would not be inside of an integral. Um, and then we, so we basically are just integrating up all the bits of length of this um, current carrying wire. Well, if you add up all the little bits of current carrying wire in this circle, you're just gonna get the perimeter of the circle. So the integration is actually easy. Just the sum of the DLs is the total length. It's just the circumference of the um, current carrying wire, 2 pi r. Um, so we have that. So we've actually solved the problem. Now really everything is constants. Um, but to do our job the right way, we need to write it in terms of the givens, um, which were, well, uh, X, uh, capital R, and I. Well, there's I sitting there. Well, So we've, we've got a couple things going on here. We've got the... Um, cosine of this angle, which is indeed constant, but we need to write it in terms of X and R. Well, so a way to do that is this. If this angle here is theta that we've defined, this little guy here would be 90 minus theta, this angle, um, between the axis of symmetry and the diagonal blue line, uh, dotted line there. So this is 90 minus theta. And then that means that this other side of this triangle here, this would have an, uh, or this other angle in the triangle, this would be angle theta. Well, if theta here is, um, if this angle in this corner is theta, the cosine of that angle is the adjacent side, which is the radius of the circle, over the hypotenuse, which is little r. Um, and so the cosine of theta is just gonna be the radius of the circle, um, big R, um, over little r. Well, so we can just make that substitution now. So cosine theta, we can put big R over little r. So what that does is that introduces a big R here and that pumps up the uh, exponent on the r squared in the base up to r cubed, little r cubed. Well, so now the only thing here that is um, where in, makes us like not quite done is this little r again is not one of the things that was given, but we can use the Pythagorean theorem um, to relate it to, well, the other sides of the triangle defined here. So little r can be written as the square root of the sum of the squares. So you get square root of x squared plus big R squared. Well, then we can simply substitute that in. So little r cubed, instead of being the square root of x squared plus uh, big R squared, is going to be x squared plus big R squared to the three halves power. Um, and so finally, we've done it. We've got this expression for the magnetic field. Um, at this point um, as it depends on X as you move away from this, um, from this current carrying loop. Uh, final comment here is if you set X equal to zero, that would actually be the field dead center of this loop um, if, the, if the X value were equal to zero. And you notice you would get what? You'd get mu naught I over 2R because you'd have a um, R squared in the numerator, big R squared, and you'd have an R cubed in the denominator. Um, so hopefully you found that helpful. That's a very popular example of using the Beot-Savart law. Thank you for tuning in.